Hi, and welcome to Community Producers. I'm your host, Shondell. First up on the show, we have the Below Average Carver, where Dwayne will show you the key tools you need to start your woodworking project. Hey everybody, it's your boy Dwayne, and welcome to the Below Average Carver. We're going to be talking today about wood carving and some of the great things that you can make with wood. So to get started, we're going to give you a slight overview of some of the tools you might need, some of the materials you can use, and some just general prep work in order to get you started on this great hobby. So what I've got in front of me here are a couple of wood spirits, and that's going to be the main focus of the next few episodes. We're going to learn to carve some of these bad boys like you see right here. Now, some of these you can actually, if you go to one of the, uh, to the Bois d'Esprit in Royalwood, you can actually see much larger versions of these. These are mostly carved, those are mostly carved with um, chainsaws, mostly power tools. What we're gonna do on these segments is deal with hand tools, manual tools. So we're gonna learn how to do a lot of things the hard way. Now, you're probably wondering, what are the types of wood that you would need for this? Now, a couple of the pieces I have here are actually cottonwood. Cottonwood is very abundant here in Winnipeg and in Manitoba, so no matter, you can find scrap wood in a lot of places, a lot of lumber yards will probably have a lot of these laying around. These are some of the softer woods that you can actually carve up. Um, softer woods like this include oak and butternut and basswood. Those are the three main ones that you're gonna wanna deal with. So how do you actually turn something like this into something like this? Well, you need the proper tools here. So right now, the first thing I'm gonna point out to you is something called a carving knife. Now, a carving knife is basically one of the main tools you'll need. And in some cases, it's the only tool you'll need. It's capable of doing a lot of detailed work. It's, de it's capable of doing a lot of shaving, a lot of large cuts, a lot of detailed line art, a lot of more more fine, like, like some of these hairs over here in the beard. This knife is actually great for doing all that. And it takes a little bit more time, but something like this, which is a flex cut, which is one of the more popular ones you can get out there, is gonna be good for most of the stuff that you need to do. Now, I've got several different hand tools here. And one of the main tools that you're gonna use is something called a V-gouge. A V-gouge does a lot of the same type of stuff that the flex cut knife does, but it gives you a little bit more control. It does fine line work, as you can see. It would be great for doing these deep grooves here. It's great for doing uh, lines under the eyes, some of the uh, some of the eyebrow work that happens on some on on units like this. It's very good for something like that. In addition to the V gouge, you have many different size ones, but you also have something like this, this um, more of a dovetail shaped item. It's great for doing a lot of the more larger, clearing off the larger spaces and clearing off some of the more uglier portions of the piece that you're trying to do. In addition to that, you have different kind of chisels. Uh, you have something like a, uh, a skew. A skew is not really used that much, but a skew can be great for some angle work, for something like if you were, say, doing a, some relief work on like a house roof or something like that, which we'll get to later on. And you have a straight chisel, which is also great for the same types of things. So you can actually clear off large, large areas in not a lot of time. Also, finally, there are, there are usually other tools called uh, dovetails or, um, or fishtails. Now, I don't have, unfortunately, I don't have one of those here, but those are also great for detail work. And they're also great at getting into a lot tighter areas. Like if you were, let's say you're gonna do some work over here on around the nose, and a, a dovetail has like a finer end that actually gets right in there and it doesn't damage a lot of, you know, some of the surface area and some of the, uh, some of the outstretched areas that you might wanna might want to tackle. Now, in addition to some of that, one of the most important things you're really going to need is some sandpaper. Now, wood is not going to be smooth no matter what you do. And as you carve, the edges are going to get rough, they're going to get a little, they're going to get a little distressed. And a decent piece of sandpaper from like 100 grit and down, you want something a little bit more, 
how do I say, more gritty, a little bit more grainy, and it'll actually smooth your workout very fine, and that's what you, you want, a nice smooth surface as you go on. So as you can see on something like this, these cheek lines, these cheekbones, and in and around some of the eye, uh, eyebrow work here, a lot of that is going to be really going to need to be sanded down as you work. It, it takes care of a lot. As you can keep up with it, you're not going to have a lot of, you know, prep work to do and a lot more more sanding to do after that. Now in addition, which we will get to later on as well, there are also power tools and it takes takes so much time away from the project and it does some really fabulous work but down the road we're going to get to that eventually but for the next time I'm going to let you guys get all your tools, I'm going to let you guys get your hands on some wood and then we are going to start carving one of these bad boys so for now my name is Dwayne and we're going to see you next time on the Below Average Carver. So that is an Argentine black and white tegu. It's kind of like a monitor lizard. They're sort of like their cousin to them. Um, we got two of these guys from the province from Provincial Animal Care. They had been seized because they weren't being taken care of properly, unfortunately. Uh, so this guy, he was in the better shape of the two. You can see him out and about walking around. Um, but his brother, unfortunately, who's inside the kennel there, um, we'll see when they bring him out. He, unfortunately, has no ability to use his back legs. Uh, these guys require special care. Unfortunately, a lot of people think of them as just big dogs. You can let run around your house, but that, that's definitely not the case. Um, these guys are now illegal in Winnipeg uh, after 2013. So we have ours because they were permitted. Um, but if you see that hump in that guy's back there, um, he wasn't given the proper lights, which don't help them metabolize their um, calcium that they need to digest. And they need a lot of proper diet and calcium in their diet um, so that their bones stay strong. If their bones don't stay strong, they get weak like noodles, and they'll get a kink in their back like that. Their jaw can fall, different things like that. Their bones just become soft, which is definitely not good. Um, the lights are pretty expensive, again, they need a large enclosure, good humidity, and the food, they're eating almost every day, a couple mice, a couple chicks, full chicken drumsticks, fish, shrimp, things like that. Um, so the unfortunate part with our buddy here with the metabolic bone disease is what it's called when they can't do digest their calcium and uh, metabolic, um, metamorphosize it properly, um, is that uh, he lost also the ability to use his back legs. You'll see here he's kind of sort of dragging himself along, um, and the other problem is his bowels weren't working properly. So although he would eat, he couldn't pass. Um, so he ended up going to the Cinnabuane Park Zoo and we worked with uh, a doctor there um, and uh, they gave him some enemas to help him through, but we decided that unfortunately that's not the best quality of life for a lizard like this. Um, so he was unfortunately euthanized because it's not the, the best for that. Animal. You can see him here just struggling, trying to get back into that enclosure. It's really sad and that's why one of the main reasons we do what we do is to help educate people on how to take care of these animals properly, um, which animals do make better pets and which ones don't. You'll also see on his tail there a big white spot. Um, he had had his tail wrapped around a heat lamp and actually burned the scales and stuff off his tail. Um, heat lamps are definitely necessary in some cases, um, but they need to be secured properly with a cage so the animal can't burn themselves or heat pads are often better. But you can see them just crawling back in for a little snuggle now. Is the other guy still with you? Yep. Yep, we have Cletus is still with us. That's the brother who's still doing pretty well there. And uh, we had another one that was surrendered to us named Grizz. Uh, Grizz and Houdini are actually two of uh, the ones that we have at our facility now people can come visit. Welcome to another episode of Tea Journey. In today's episode, I will be talking about the art of Kung Fu Tea. The word Kung Fu literally means achieving mastery or excellence by a patient practice. Kung Fu Tea is a way of preparing tea. Essentially, making tea the Kung Fu way is to control all the variables of tea making with precise and stable hand movements as well as mental focus in order to get the maximum flavor with multiple brews. 
It is not really a ceremony as the Japanese tradition with its symbolism, but a process of practical steps where many factors in the process has a functional purpose to make a tea taste as good as possible. Tea cupping is a standard analytical process of evaluating tea. Cupping is used to determine the quality of the tea by observing five factors. The dry leaf, aroma, color of the tea liquor, steeped leaf, and the taste. Comparing to the British tradition of making a mug of tea, to enjoy tea the Gong Fu way is using relatively small vessels, large quantity of loose leaves, and extremely short steeping time, typically a few seconds to a minute, depending on the type of tea. If we were to steep higher grade teas in a mug for an extended period of time, the teas will be fully saturated in the process and all the aromas and flavors will be lumped together. Decant within a few seconds prevent precisely this kind of coarse treatment. And through multiple rounds of steeping, tea chemicals are released in layers, thus you can experience the distinct changes across rounds of brews, much similar to the appreciation of wine, coffee, and perfume. Thank you for watching. This is Tea Journey with Tea Chen. Next up on The Candid Chef, we're going to the Sherbrooke Street Deli. On today's episode of The Candid Chef, we're hanging out with John Hochman, owner of Sherbrooke Street Deli. You can find John in his kitchen at 102 Sherbrooke Street. John's restaurant is influenced by both New York and Montreal style delis, with the menu being heavily inspired by his family's home cooking. John partnered with FB Hospitality to open his restaurant in March 2015. He also owns the Sherbrooke Street Deli food truck that was parked in the corner of Penn and McGillivray this past summer. John is in his kitchen starting in the early hours of the morning. Let's go check it out. Hi, John. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Uh, what are we making today? We're going to be doing some soft scrambled eggs uh, with uh, roasted potatoes, schmaltz onions, uh, some dill, and some green onions. So when do you normally eat this dish? Uh, you know, for me, like working in the kitchen and working in the business and the restaurant business, uh, it's really hard to kind of like be eating through the day. So for me, I always find like I'm always drawn to eating eggs, kind of that kind of breakfasty food, more like when I'm done shift, um, you know, late at night or even first thing in the morning. Makes sense. Yeah, for sure. How long have you been in the industry for? Uh, for about 12 years now. Where did you get started? What was your first? Uh, what was your first move? Well. I, uh, I first fell in love with cooking. Um, I worked at a summer camp out in Ontario. Okay. And you know, I was washing dishes and kind of like putting together meals for campers. That's where I kind of first got drawn to the kitchen. Yeah. Uh, my first actual job was at a Dairy Queen, <laughs> um, in which I actually got let go because they said I'd never make it in the business, uh, which I thought was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. Holy. And um, did you serve ice cream there? Of course. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, good. You have to get that perfect like Dairy Queen at the top. <laughs> so, I basically um, learned that and then they fired me. Oh my god. Yeah. How, how crushing is that? And now we're here, right? And now we're here. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay, it's a learning experience. There you go. Yeah. What has been for you the biggest difference switching from kind of always working in the street at night to taking these morning shifts now? Well, between the, 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 the prep side, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just great. I mean, waking up in the morning, you know, nobody's out on the street. You kind of like, it's a different vibe, right? It's like, yeah. you know, starting the day, you know, you don't have any of the stresses of, of like the regular day yet. Um, had you ever traveled to New York or Montreal to kind of like do some investigations or? Yeah, Montreal. Um, New York, I uh, actually haven't been. Um, I'm just like very familiar with what their offerings are as far as they always go. Yeah. Um, for Montreal though, um, yeah, I mean, like, Schwartz is the main, you know, these are places that, you know, are delicious. Um, and of course, I was very inspired by it. 
so that's where we are today. Where do you do all of the prep for, you know, your bagels and your, yeah, just everything. I mean, that would take a lot of space to brine and kind of let all that meat sit, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. We have a, um, we have a separate prep facility where we do most of our, like, our brining and our smoking. Yeah. Um, you know, even our big batches, like our soups and our coleslaw. Yeah. Um, so we have a prep kitchen for that. And then, you know, for our bagels, um, you know, we make them here every morning. Did you always kind of know that you would end up having a deli, or was it something that you just kind of came to on the road to get here? Throughout all my, my career, my food has always kind of had a little bit of like my roots into it. Yeah. And I've always wanted to open a deli. Um, you know, from the age of like nine to 13, mm -hmm. I would actually like make up little like deli concepts. <laughs> and, and I'd call it like Saul's Delicatessen, and I'd name up my grandfather. Cause, like, oh, okay, yeah. Because he would always like show me like, you know, what delis are all about. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I think, you know, subconsciously, I always knew that I wanted to, to do deli. What have you kind of learned um, having worked in, I don't know, how many restaurants have you worked in? Uh, you know, I'd probably say probably like six, six yeah. or seven restaurants. Um, all, you know, from steakhouses to, you know, Spanish tapas restaurants to sushi restaurants. Yeah. Um, you know, a wide variety. Um, I've definitely diversified in my career, but um, for me, it's just doing this casual food is the most appealing. Yeah. You know, you can still take all those techniques and the care that you would for, you know, the finer foods. Yeah. And, and bring it to something like this. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the end product is just so amazing. If I want to come back and have you cook for me again, where can I come find you? We are at 102 Sherbrooke, so just north of uh, Westminster in uh, the West Broadway area. Cool. And if you want to find the recipe for what we made today, it will be on the Candid Chef website, thecandidchef.com. And yeah, thanks for having me. Let's, let's dig in. Thanks for coming down. A thank you to our sponsor, Peak of the Market. So on this week's pet profile, we have Pam featured, which is a four-year-old Labrador cross. Meet Pam. This fun-loving girl spent most of her previous life on a chain, but she doesn't let that get her down. She's excited to get out and see what this big world has to offer. Pam loves to play with other dogs, and her ideal home would have a fenced yard where she can run around or suntan. She is untested with cats and would prefer a quiet home where she can relax, hang out with her people, and take as many naps as she wants. She can be shy at first, but warms up quickly to anyone willing to give her a cookie and a pat on the head. Pam is a great cuddler, takes her cookies gently, and happily goes into her kennel when it's time for her family to leave. When it comes to love, this gal can't get enough. So if you have love to spare, contact Earth Dog Terrier Rescue. Excuse me? Excuse me. You don't know who I am? I'm Emily Stowe, the woman of first. I was the first female to become a principal in Upper Canada, and I was also the first female to practice medicine in Canada. You know what? I'll tell you my life story, and then you'll determine my importance to Canada. I was born on May 1st, 1831, on a small farm in Norwich Township, Ontario. I was the first of six daughters to a mother who hated public school, so she chose to homeschool all six of us daughters. At age 15, I became a teacher in a one-room schoolhouse in Southern Ontario. Can you imagine that? A 15-year-old girl left with 30 children to teach. After seven years of teaching, I decided to go back to school. I applied to Victoria College in Coburg, Ontario, but there was denied because there was a woman. Eventually, I was accepted. 
accepted into Toronto Normal School, and two years after that, I graduated with first class honors. After I graduated, I was offered a position on the board of Central School in Brantford, Ontario. There, I became the first woman to be a principal in Upper Canada. After seven years of being principal, I decided to step down to get married. And in 1863, my husband, John Stowe, contracted tuberculosis. This inspired me to study herbal healing and homeopathic medicine, which later led to my decision to become a physician. I applied to the Toronto School of Medicine, but was denied again just because I was a woman. I was later accepted into New York Medical College for Women, and in 1867, I graduated. After graduating from Medical College in New York City, I moved to Toronto and set up a small medical practice. This is what one of my treatment rooms looked like. While attending medical school in New York, I became involved with women's suffrage. And after I graduated and returned to Toronto, I established the Toronto Women's Literacy Club. This club prepared professional papers on women's professional achievement and the vote. Thanks to this club, higher educations were offered to women. Thanks to my daughter, Augusta Stowe, I became a founding member of the Theosophical Society. This society encouraged equality of all people, including people of different races, genders, and colors. This society also encouraged studies in philosophy, science, and different religions. Thanks to this society, widows and unmarried women eventually got the municipal vote in Ontario in 1883. So kids, what do you think now? Hi, my name is Adrian Barnett, and I go to Holy Ghost School. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Emily Stowe was a courageous and inspiring woman. She fought a battle for women's rights and gender equality. She was the first female principal in Upper Canada and also the first female doctor in Canada. And she also played an important role in the women's suffrage movement. Emily Stowe helped pave the way of other suffragists like Nellie McClough. I believe that without Emily Stowe, women's rights would not have progressed to the point that they have today. I hope that this video shows why Emily Stowe is an important Canadian hero. Welcome again to Chico's Corner. Here in the beautiful day, we have Chris, we have Kate, and today's uh, segment is gonna be on trapping again. The trapping part, the control of the ball, but the ball is in the air, we're going to in, do the instep trap, okay? So again, as the ball is coming in, I want you just to do this part, and if you can do this, you, you've done the drill. All right, so again, this is the movement, that needs to be done. So Chris, I'll have Chris here. I'll throw him a ball. We can start in this. Okay, just pass it to me on the ground, yeah. All right, you can pass it on, and then you can have two players passing the ball back and forth again with your hands. Just start, go. So very simple. It's like an elevator. So you're bringing the ball down, all right. Also, the key to this is to make sure that your toe is pointing down so when the ball hits, it comes off the as opposed to be flat. So again, let's see if we can do that. And you can start there. Perfect, that was really good. Okay, she's using more of the elevator and that's fine. Good, and then you can push yourself and you one to the right, one to the left. And again, we can improve it a little bit quicker, right? And then if you want to challenge yourself, keep going, keep going, keep going. I'm going to just quickly get another ball for you. Keep going. They can challenge themselves, and then there's going to be two balls. So throw, okay, control. And again, one under, one over. Okay, so again now, their concentration on the task is a little bit more difficult. One is throwing over, the other one is throwing under. Okay, and you can do it on the bounce as well. They don't all have to be in the air. Again, 
and this is how you would start okay this is called the instep control okay it's like an elevator going up and down very simple a very a very big technique in soccer that is, is, is it has to be done okay so now what we can do is have cake over there okay cake goes over there and again Kate you're going to be passing the balls to we have two big squares here and the squares will represent where they need to control the ball so Kate kicks the ball in Chris must maintain the ball down good so he controlled it with his chest but the last part was the elevator so that's exactly what we're looking for you can let it bounce control it with the end step please right so again it, that's the key at, of it all you can let it bounce yeah control it perfect that that's exactly what you want to do at the beginning get in front of the path before the control so we had a little bit of a hard time there perfect that's a great demo and again perfect cross good all right so we can turn this into a game guys in this game you can play with two players and all you need to do is get yourself set up like a five by five square and then have a partner and whoever gets to three wins so now not only you're introducing a little bit of a challenge to yourself now it's a game so whoever hits gets three points wins okay so again ball comes in that ah, no point zero zero okay she controlled it pretty good but the ball wasn't in her square and and bring it down bring it down come on you have to bring it down with uh bring it down with uh instep all right you can chest it it's okay all right so here we go nice let it bounce and control it it's not your fault that if he didn't kick it in right so it's one nothing for kate good if it stays in it's a point one one that's perfect two one for kate and so on and so forth and you're gonna have to come see us again to see who wins kate or chris at chico's corner see you again Thanks so much for joining us today on Community Producers. I'm your host, Shondell. And if you have something to share or you would like to host yourself, please email us at createtv at shaw.ca. We'll see you next time.